On March the 27th, 1977, Tenerife, a tropical paradise in the Canary Islands, became a killing field. Do something, go faster, go back. When two jumbo jets collide with one another. I think I must have said a very short prayer. I hope he misses us. And that's when I just close my eyes and duck. In the way the Titanic came to be more than just a disaster and a kind of epic and, and really cemented itself in history as this iconic event, I think to an aero historian, the crash at Tenerife kind of uh, did the same thing. Could such an accident be waiting to happen today? Aviation's worst disaster, Tenerife, on Most Deadly. Time stops for those involved in an air crash. It stops for those caught inside the disaster and for anyone who studies the aftermath. In most cases, all that is left is wreckage and sometimes haunting photographic evidence. A DC-10 crashes in Chicago in 1979 when hydraulic failure causes an engine to be torn away from the body of the plane. A PSA 727 collides with a small private plane in 1978 on final approach into San Diego. Hijacking results in this crash of a 757 into the sea near the Comoroche Islands in 1996. Every air disaster is different, but at the root of each can be found one or more causes from a grimly familiar list. Terrorism, mechanical malfunction, weather, technical trouble, human error. Very rarely does a plane wreck result from a combination of all these recurring factors. That is exactly what happened on the Canary Islands in 1977, when a perfect storm of catastrophe touched down on the Tenerife runway. What we're looking at is Charlie 4. As you see, Charlie 4, where it joins the active runway, is where the accident uh, occurred. Co-pilot Robert Bragg is the only surviving officer from the historic crash. I think it changes you when you see that much devastation and that many people so badly hurt. Uh, I think uh, the things that probably you didn't consider important in life before the accident becomes much more important. On March 27, 1977, two jumbo 747 jets collide, approaching the C-4 taxiway at Tenerife. The catastrophe claims 583 lives, the greatest death toll from a single aviation incident to date. No one aboard KLM Flight 4805 survives, and only 70 people on Pan Am Flight 1736 escape the inferno that engulfed both planes. The entire top of the airplane was gone, and you... It, reminded me of some giant knife that had just sliced the entire top of the fuselage off. We did not need to wait for a command from the captain. I just jumped up and started shouting the commands you shout to evacuate the plane. Both of the wings were on fire burning. On the left wing of the airplane, there were 55 to 60 people already standing out on that wing. And as I looked at the door, it, it just kind of crumpled. There shouldn't have been anything there. It was just the top of the airplane. Um, and instead, it was a mountain of debris. Next thing I knew, Joan was up there. And I was standing there. And she leaned down and said, Suzanne grabbed my hand. And she just yanked me out of that plane. Although it occurred decades ago, for pilots and controllers, 
the disaster at Tenerife remains the benchmark for all that can go wrong in an airplane. Like many commercial pilots, Patrick Smith is awed by the scope of the disaster. One of the only things that will uh, hush a room full of pilots during uh, a training class is uh, a video or a presentation about what happened at Tenerife. All the bizarre coincidences and, and twisted ironies that, that were part of the crash, and really the horror, but at the same time, the, um, again, this weird mystique. The events in Tenerife resulted from an almost inconceivable chain of bad luck and worse circumstance. Terrorism shuts down one airport, rerouting huge airliners to another airport with only a single runway to handle the new traffic. Key radio transmissions cancel each other out and warnings given 1736 report when runway clear are never heard. Weather shrouds the airport in fog and huge planes are forced to maneuver out of sight from one another. A cascading series of human errors provide the final accelerant. Tenerife is a rather unique, and on the other hand, it's not rather unique, because if you really look, there were many factors that they culminated and caused that catastrophic accident. That's why we characterize accidents like Tenerife, low probability, but high consequence, because you need to have all those factors, they come together. Exactly what happened here on this runway in 1977? How did it happen? And more importantly, can it happen again? 1448, you shouldn't be anywhere near I think anyone who's been through an accident automatically asks himself what they could have done possibly to have prevented the accident. There were six men in the cockpits of both 747s. Three died that afternoon. Today, only one pilot remains. Now, Captain Robert Bragg has agreed to go back into the cockpit to recreate with a simulated crew the exact unfolding chain of events leading to the deadly collision. The dialogue we are about to hear comes directly from the transcripts of the tapes recorded that day. When, in the space of an hour, miscommunication, impatience, poor visibility, and technical malfunction culminated in the most deadly aviation catastrophe in history. A disaster that could happen again. The Canary Islands are seven extinct volcanic outcrops in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North Africa. Santa Cruz de Tenerife and Los Palmas are among them. These Spanish-controlled islands are exotic tourist destinations for many Europeans. Ancient seafarers called them the Fortunate Isles. But good fortune was nowhere to be found on Sunday, March 27, 1977, when unprecedented catastrophe enveloped Tenerife Airport. Captain Robert Bragg was at ground zero that day. He was co-pilot beside Captain Victor Grubbs on Pan Am Flight 1736, carrying 380 passengers from New York's JFK Airport to Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. At roughly 2 p.m., on approach to the Las Palmas Airport, an unusual call comes in from air traffic control. Coming out of about 12,000 feet, we got a request to change frequencies from the Spanish air traffic controller. He says, Keeper 1736, contact Tenerife, approach immediately. So we said, uh, we're destined for Las Palmas, not Tenerife. Why are we being vectored to Tenerife? And he said, There has been a terrorist bomb exploding in the Las Palmas airport. Please 
boarding and last palm of the terminal building. You are to proceed to alternate Tenerife. Heeding the tower command, Captain Bragg and his crew now redirect their jumbo jet to Tenerife's Los Rodeos Airport, about 25 minutes away on the island of Santa Cruz de Tenerife. And we contacted the tower, and they immediately said, You are clear to land, runway 30 in Tenerife. The weather was perfectly clear. We could see the airport from about 15 miles out. We saw probably 50 airplanes that had been diverted there because uh, this was around 3 in the afternoon on Sunday afternoon. So there were, the whole ramp area was completely congested. Clipper 1736, taxi and exit at the end of the runway and hold a position behind the KLM ahead of you. Our parking area was uh, the fourth position in a line of four airplanes. So there were three other airplanes in front of us, including KLM, which was directly in front of us. KLM Flight 4805, another 747 carrying 234 passengers and 14 crew members, had also been diverted from Las Palmas to Tenerife because of the terrorist threat. The captain on the KLM is Jakob von Janten, KLM's chief pilot and principal flight instructor. First officer is Klaus Mears, a newly trained co-pilot that Captain von Janten had himself tested on a similar craft just six months prior. Behind Mears sits the flight engineer, William Schroeder. Now crew and passengers on all the diverted aircraft wait at the Tenerife airport, unsure how long a delay lay ahead. The sight of stacked jumbo jets was enough to draw interest from the local residents one of whom took this, the only photograph, showing Captain Bragg's Pan Am 747 lined up directly behind the KLM Jumbo. Among the Pan Am flight attendants were Suzanne Donovan and Joan Jackson. The passengers, as I recall, were not allowed to deplane, right. um, which was why we were doing a service on the ground, giving them whatever we had. But I don't remember anyone being um, really overwhelmingly dismayed at this. That was just a little glitch that was going to pass. Likewise, aboard the KLM flight, cockpit crew and passengers hunkered down for a wait. Perhaps they take comfort in the career achievements of their pilot, who is featured in their complimentary issue of KLM's in-flight magazine. And finally, we heard the tower operator say, Gentlemen, be advised that Las Palmas is now open. About 3.45, news of this announcement from the tower comes as a relief to everyone. Planes have been grounded for almost two hours. But the wait isn't over yet. Now KLM Captain Jakob von Janten makes an unusual decision to refuel. His action is unnecessary. Records later show that the plane had sufficient reserves. The Pan Am crew was surprised and annoyed by the delay. The Captain Big Grubbs called KLM and asked him, uh, KLM uh, 4805, how long will you take to refuel? And the KLM pilot responded uh, very abruptly. 35 minutes. So the captain then looked at me and said, well, I guess we're stuck behind him. And then I, sitting on the right side of the airplane, made the comment, well, maybe we can get around him. Would you like the engineer, George Warrens, and I to go out and measure the distance between our right wing and his left wing? And we were 12 feet inside of his wing clearance. So we were 12 feet short of getting around him. Basically, we waited 35 minutes for the KLM plane to refuel. Now, on a look-back basis, if we'd have had two wing walkers, wing walkers being people that stand on your wingtip and visually give you a clearance, uh, we could have possibly gotten around him, but we had no feeling of any absolute necessity to get this done. Rerouted flights, an odd decision to refuel, 12 feet of clearance. So begins the terrible list of seemingly unrelated details that would ultimately form links in a deadly chain. In the 35 minutes it will take for the KLM to refuel, 
yet another adverse condition descends upon the runway at Tenerife. A fog bank comes down off the side of this hill and stops right on the runway. And that fog is to become a funeral shroud for 583 men, women, and children. On the afternoon of March 27, 1977, in Spain's Canary Islands, Las Palmas is closed. a terrorist bomb detonates at Las Palmas Airport, causing dozens of arriving flights to be rerouted to Tenerife, a neighboring island with a single runway airfield. Pan American Flight 1736 from New York, co-piloted by Captain Bragg, is one of two jumbo jets now assembled in a lineup awaiting instruction from air traffic control at Tenerife. Parked directly in front of the Pan Am Jumbo is KLM Flight 4805 out of Amsterdam, piloted by veteran captain Jakob von Janten. After an almost three hour ground delay, the tower finally clears all flights for departure to their original destinations. Gentlemen, be advised that Las Palmas is now open. Unfortunately, the KLM pilot's decision to refuel will result in an additional 35-minute delay for his flight and all those behind him, including the Pan Am Jumbo. Finally, at 4.58 p.m., after filling the KLM's tank with an additional 14,500 gallons of fuel, co-pilot Klaus Mears contacts the Tenerife Tower for permission to taxi for takeoff. We require a backtrack on 1-2 for takeoff, runway 30. OK, KLM A0, uh, correction, 4 A05, taxi straight ahead for the runway, and uh, make backtrack. Roger, make a backtrack. <laughs> Because Tenerife's airport is small, departing planes must backtrack to lift off. That means taxiing down the runway to the end, then turning around to take off in the same direction they originally came from. There was a DC-9 in the number one position. There was a DC-8 in the second position or the number two position. Then KLM was in the number three position. We were in the number four position. They gave the clearances, the taxi clearance, to the first two airplanes, and it was thus that they were, were to taxi and backtrack down the runway. In other words, they taxi down the runway in the opposite direction of where they're going to be taking off. When you get to the last taxiway on your left, exit the runway and position back. At 4.59 p.m., KLM Flight 4805 begins to taxi down the runway. Approach, uh, you want us to turn left at Charlie 1? Taxi bay Charlie 1? Negative, negative. Taxi straight ahead up to the end of the runway and make back truck. OK, sir. A few minutes later at 5.02, Pan Am is instructed to follow KLM's taxi down the runway. But unlike KLM, the Pan Am flight is to turn off at one of the several taxi exits and wait. This in order to clear the runway for KLM to lift off. It's with these instructions that confusion starts to arise. It is unclear to the pilots of the Pan Am flight exactly which taxi exit traffic control intends for them to take. We got the instructions from the tower. Pan Am 1736, stay third taxi, wait to your left. We had just passed C2. If, as some people have contended, we were supposed to take Charlie 3, that taxiway takes you right back into the terminal area. All of the taxiways on that terminal were blocked, so we'd have not been anywhere. We'd have had to just wait there again. Feeling that the Charlie 3 taxiway must not be their intended destination, the Pan Am crew calls the tower again for clarification. The third one said one, two, three, the third, third one. Since their jet has already passed the first exit, in telling them to take the third exit, the crew believes the tower intends for them to exit at C4, the third exit from C1. The other airplane had done the very same thing. It was the logical taxiway to get off the runway up. So uh, we all felt very confident that that was the taxiway that we were supposed to depart the runway on. And then, just when things are teetering dangerously out of control, fate strikes. A thick fog suddenly descends on the airfield. And I looked out the window and I said to Suzanne, we're not going anywhere. I can't even see the number two engine, which is the inboard engine. 
I knew our regulations at Pan Am. We, we would not be going anywhere. It was too foggy. Yeah, we expected so to go to the... Back kind of to hole. wherever we, yeah. <laughs> we had been sitting. The island has a reputation of very quickly fogging in. And the visibility went from unlimited down to 500 meters, which is about 1,500 feet. And we could just barely see the runway in front of the nose. And at the same time, looking for our taxiway that we were supposed to turn off to the left to, to clear the active runway and to get uh, off the runway and into position back of the KLM. Like many small single runway airports, Tenerife was not equipped with ground radar allowing air traffic controllers to monitor aircraft on the field. But even as the airfield is enveloped by fog, the decision to go ahead with takeoff remains in place. That particular runway, as most runways are, were very highly painted to give you the center line, and we were barely able to see the runway. And the captain had slown the airplane down to like three knots, just barely moving. We were just beginning to see the curved directional lines to take us off on the Charlie Four, which was the taxiway we were looking for. Having lost sight of the KLM and the Pan Am jets, the tower now seeks to get verbal confirmation on the relative location of both planes on the runway. KLM 4805, how many taxiway uh, did you pass? I think uh, we just passed Charlie Four now. Both cockpit crews and the air traffic controllers are now working outside of their comfort zones. Okay, at the end of the runway, make 180 and report. Uh, ready for ATC clearance. The KLM reaches the end of the runway and turns 180 degrees. What happens next? is an extraordinary exchange between pilot and co-pilot. This is the KLM cockpit conversation taken from the transcripts. Wait a minute. We did not have ATC clearance yet. No, I know that. Go ahead and ask. This exchange suggests that Von Janten had begun to take off until his co-pilot reminds him that he did not have clearance. This is an unusual interaction as Von Janten, the senior officer, was not used to having his judgment questioned in his own cockpit. Democracy in the cockpit is a very cultural issue. There are some culture that they are basically very high in power distance, meaning that there is a very strong hierarchy and very steep hierarchy in their society. We cannot expect they have a democracy in the cockpit. Von Janten waits impatiently for further instructions from ground control. The KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff. Um, and we're waiting for our ATC clearance. It's a routing clearance that uh, air traffic control gives the departing plane that basically tells him how to tr go from one airport, your departure point, to your destination. Report, uh, ready for ATC clearance. But even ATC, or air traffic control clearance, is only a confirmation of the in-flight route to be taken. Clearance to actually take off must be given separately. It is these next few moments of communication between the tower and the two planes that will forever be analyzed. All right, sir, we are cleared to the Papa Beacon flight level 90. We heard the KLM uh, pilot read the clearance back which is required. As soon as he finished reading the ATC clearance back, he added a comment that was totally unexpected to us. And we're now at takeoff. Okay, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. But we were still taxing down, assuming that KLM was going to be holding his position as he was directed to do. And that's when I got on the radio and said, but we're still on the runway. 1736, report one runway clear. Von Janten again begins the takeoff. If there were any further objections in his cockpit, the transcripts do not reveal them. The huge, fully fueled jumbo jet begins to pick up speed. The point of no return has now been passed. 
When we first saw the KLM airplane, it wasn't of great concern because we knew he was down there. Then I noticed his landing lights were on, and I saw his light shaking. And then that's when I said, I think he's moving. Is he not your off, Don? Yes, sir. Is he not your off, the Pond American? Yeah, well. I could see his rotating beacon, and he lifted off. Now, do something. Pull back, sir. Pull back. I just could not believe that this airplane was taking off coming right at us. On a fog-bound runway, two 747 jumbo jets desperately attempt to escape each other's path. But it's too late. And I said, he's moving, get off to the captain. He went to full power on the throttles. We were only going three knots, so the airplane was moving very slowly. I think I must have said a very short prayer. I hope he misses us. And that's when I just closed my eyes and ducked. And then suddenly there was this thud, this tremendous impact. Joan jumped up, ran to her door, looked out the, the window, and yelled, fire on the wing. The entire top of the fuselage was severed. If you look at uh, the window of the airplane, those windows were gone, and the entire top of the airplane was gone. So what I did uh, when I decided to leave, and I was yelling at everybody to get out, I stood up on the foot of the cockpit floor that was remaining and uh, reached over and grabbed the back of the captain's seat, Victor Grubb's seat, and then just jumped right over the side. I continued making my way down through this um, bits of the fuselage and, and uh, things and got about five feet or so. There was an edge, a precipice about five feet tall, and there was a group of passengers there, eight maybe eight or 10 passengers. And I started pushing them, saying, you know, jump, jump. We have to get out of here. And then the debris shifted again. And then everybody, all of us, were just kind of leaping to try to get away from where the debris was shifting. Because the engines now were spewing all the metals. They were disintegrating so severely. No one got out of the airplane past row 33. Reason for that was when KLM hit us, he severed his landing gear into our airplane. Matter of fact, they found his landing gear, uh, the main landing gear, in our wreckage. After escaping the Pan Am wreck, passenger David Wiley borrowed another survivor's camera to take these two extraordinary photos in the immediate aftermath of the crash. So I went up and I started yelling at them for jump, and they did. Everybody just came straight off and uh, hitting a large group on the ground. One man, I noticed, grabbed uh, a lady by the ankle and just started running as fast as he could. Turned out later that uh, the lady that was being drugged across the ground was the wife of the man that was pulling her. And when she hit, all of the other people hit on front of, on top of her and broke her back, both arms and both legs. Fifteen hundred feet further down the runway, what was left of the KLM flight lay smoldering. A full tank of fuel turned the jet into a bonfire of twisted metal. Not one of the 248 people on board survived. And I think that was our first thought. That was that our first thought. It was thought. a bomb. And we were astonished when someone pointed out that there was another plane down the runway on fire. We had no idea. In the chaos of the aftermath, rescue workers never made it to the Pan Am site in time to aid injured survivors. I recall walking around to the passengers who were on the ground who had been able to evacuate, who were clearly injured, and trying to lean down and reassure them, I'd say, don't worry, the ambulances are, are coming. Help is on the way. The emergency equipment will be here soon. And meanwhile, we never saw any emergency equipment. 
we never saw ambulances or fire trucks. What had happened was, when KLM hit us, the sailor's landing gear exploded and hit 1,500 feet down the runway. His sight was closer to the tower than ours was. The tower called both of us and couldn't get any return communication. And about the same time, a airplane in the holding pattern right above the airport called the tower and said that he saw fire and wreckage on his runway. The fire trucks and ambulances come out and they get to KLM first. So this is why no one came out to our site. About that time, the center fuel tank of the airplane, which is located uh, right under the uh, wing as it joins the fuselage down in that area, the center fuel tank exploded and shot a flame probably two or 300 feet up into the air. It strikes me as very ironic that if there was fire equipment there uh, trying to put out the fire at KLM, if only they'd known there were potential survivors at our plane that if they'd been able to get there, it might have helped. The final toll is horrific. Of the 380 passengers on the Pan Am flight, only 54 survived their injuries. Every one of the 248 people on the KLM flight perish in the accident. Shortly after the, the accident, uh, it was much too emotional to talk about it. And it, to Suzanne and I, it didn't feel respectful of the people who had lost their lives. We wanted mm. not to gloat we were still alive, you know. What sense can be made of such devastation? Is there anything to be learned from the kind of impossible tragedy represented by Tenerife? Root causes for the catastrophe at Tenerife are manifold. The University of Southern California School of Engineering is home to an internationally famous aviation safety research and training program. Dr. Najmadeen Mashkadi focuses on human error factors. When you look at the contributing factors of Tenerife, which we were able to identify like nine or 10 human factors related contributing factors. At the end of the day, in its core, is a human factors problem. I know, I know the that. culture inside the that. KLM cockpit would prove to be the most closely analyzed set of human errors attributed to the crash. One of the biggest problems that was raised in the case of KLM at the Tenerife was that Captain Van Zanten, because of his personality, he was like a chief pilot, a poster boy pilot for the KLM, and that it was very hard to disagree with him. Cultural factors can play a tremendous role within the cockpit, between the pilot and co-pilot, and between the cockpit and air traffic controller their interaction. As you see that, you, you are really at the mercy of cultural factors. They say that they're off. They found American. <laughs> yeah, well. And as it turned out, it was actually the flight engineer, this is the third in command in the, on the flight deck, who actually questioned whether the Pan American airplane was off the runway. He was the only one who did. And the captain responded that, yes, he was emphatically that he was off the runway. While the consequences of human dynamics at Tenerife will long be debated, other failures are more cut and dry. One critical but little discussed root cause has been attributed to a common technical glitch in radio communications. Okay, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. I responded by keying the mic and saying, we are still on the runway. Roger Alpha, 1736, report when runway clear. Tragically, Robert Bragg's urgent message that his 747 is still on the runway and in the direct path of the KLM 747 is never clearly received. He goes unheard because of a radio frequency phenomenon known as the heterodyne effect. Patrick Smith is a commercial airline pilot and author. Most of the time, pilots communicate via a two-way VHF radio. And the way that works is a, a crew member or an air traffic controller picks up a microphone or uh, using the headset and uh, the hand switch on the yoke, clicks the mic, makes the transmission, releases the mic, 
and waits for an acknowledgement or, uh, in pilot speak, a readback. Three Gulf Charlie's ready at uh, Foxtrot 25 left. Three Gulf Charlie, runway 25 left, position hold. Position hold 25 left, Three Gulf Charlie. The trouble arises when two or more transmissions are made at the same time. They effectively cancel each other out, and the result is a prolonged squeal or uh, just a hail of static. What happened to Tenerife is that two very critical transmissions that effectively could have prevented the accident were made at the same instant, were blocked out, and nobody caught it. There are units that can be put into airline transport uh, radios that won't allow heterodynes to occur. And for the most part, they haven't been installed. And that's not to say that there's a crisis at hand where there are you know, airplanes waiting to crash into each other all the time. It's been 30 years and it hasn't happened. And with uh, 40,000 or so airplanes taking off, commercial airplanes taking off around the world every day, the record speaks for itself. That said, it's an easy fix. Why not do it? The catastrophe that happened at Tenerife has a technical name, incursion. The Federal Aviation Administration defines a runway incursion as a collision or a near miss involving two planes either trying to land or take off. The Tenerife incursion might be the worst in history, but it will not be the last. From the last report I heard, there are still something like 300 runway incursions that occur every year throughout the world. In my case, I had never had a runaway incursion until the Tenerife accident. But one was enough, and another will be one too many. In the history of flight, mid-air near collisions are rare. However, near misses between planes where at least one of them is on the ground has become an almost daily occurrence. It was another accident six years after the Tenerife disaster at Madrid involving a collision, ground collision between a DC-9 and a Boeing 727. There was not a major ground collision after that until uh, the accident at uh, Lainete Airport at serving Milan in October of 2001. A Cessna Citation business type jet was cleared to taxi to the end of the runway and in, in, in doing so actually taxi the opposite direction and crossed the runway in which a, um, an MD-87 jet was taking off. The runway incursion at Lanate bears a strong resemblance to Tenerife. Both airports are notorious for fog and neither at the time had operating ground radar. Runway incursions are a focus of research and development for Rattan Katwa at the Honeywell Aviation Firm. From the cockpit of an incoming plane at Los Angeles International Airport, he demonstrates just what pilots are up against navigating routine air traffic control signals on any given flight. As we near the runway, two potentially dangerous situations occur. First, our call sign was very similar to the call sign for another plane. Did you hear there was a three Charlie Charlie? Yeah, on the uh, frequency. Uh, it just gave me the idea. That call sign is three Golf Charlie. What we heard on the radio on the same frequency was a very, very similar call sign, three Charlie Charlie. Um, this problem or this issue of similar call signs has in fact been a, a component in previous runway incursions. Next, something which could easily compound confusion about our call sign, a last minute change to our runway. Yeah, three Gulf Charlie, change the runway 25 right, you're clear to land, 12507. Yeah, three Gulf Charlie, runway 25 right, clear to land. The last moment on final approach, the tower controller asked us to in fact sidestep to land on the, 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 the other parallel runway. And this, of course, can set up a, an environment where the workload is high, stress can be high, and in other words, it can certainly lead to, to a situation where runway incursion could potentially be caused. Our confusing landing sequence at LAX illustrates why many believe high-tech map displays and situational advisory systems should be standard issue on commercial aircraft. But others feel technology isn't a silver bullet solution. 
A TV screen style monitor shows a graphical depiction of uh, where your airplane is relative to other airplanes on the ground and in flight. Something like that, had it been there at Tenerife, um, may have prevented the accident from happening. Skylane 6530, Mike, at 25 right for a straight out departure. Right. Sometimes this technology is more fancy than it needs to be, and you know, there are so many. Uh, multiple oral warnings and color-coded depictions. Sometimes they use more gray matter than a, than a pilot has uh, at his disposal at a given time. You know, studies show that when a crew's workload is either too high or too low, performance suffers. In 1977, a lethal combination of human error, foggy weather, technological malfunction, and overcrowding on the runway lead to the single most deadly aviation disaster in history. Every event leading to the Tenerife catastrophe could happen again at almost any airport today. Have the broader lessons of Tenerife been fully comprehended three decades after the crash? When you look at the number of landing and takeoffs which is going on around the world, at all these different airports, I think another Tenerife is not that improbable. General flying public, they have this fixation. They see a better, shinier, more modern technology. They think it's a, it's a panacea. But it's really not. If you have fog, if you have uh, uh, airport geometry, which is awkward. If you are under the time pressure, if you have a ground radar that's not operating, if you have a problem with situational awareness in your cockpit crew, be careful. I think if you went up to 100 people and said, what does Tenerife mean? Maybe seven or eight of them would know what you were talking about. But the lessons learned, um, you know, have been applied. Runway incursions uh, and, and near misses, as they're uh, misleadingly called sometimes, you know, have been on the increase. But in a way, that's a symptom of there just being so many more planes and so many more people flying. There was a study commissioned that came to show that flying in 2006 is about five or six times safer than it was in 1980. I learned from this accident, you just cannot get into a hurry in an airplane. Now, that's common nature to do that. If uh, you're running late, you have to come up with some type of procedure to get, get yourself calmed down and just say, hey, we're gonna stop, we're gonna stop the airplane if we have to until this stuff gets right. Well, when I flew down here, um, I had the very last row in the back with, in the middle of a family and there were two seats open up by the exit and I said to the flight attendant are those two seats open and may I move and she said are you willing and able to help in an evacuation I said yes <laughs> and then she said you can open the exit and assist people out I said I've done it